What's going on, everybody out there in YouTube land? Welcome back to another week of the Embracing Organics show. I'm your host, Dirtman Dan, and here we're on the show where we're trying to get you to be a little more organic in your daily practices. So this week, we are joined again by Tyler, Mr. Trees from Family Tree Seeds, and we're just kicking it, man. We're just having an organic discussion, I guess you could say. You know, whatever's on the guys' minds, whatever, whatever you guys are feeling. So, you know, let's uh, let's be nice. We can always start with our guest. What's going on, Tyler? How are you feeling? Doing great, guys. Thanks for hang- hanging. Uh, burning on some uh, Hubble. Doing the job. Uh, it's getting notes are getting big. Nights are getting cool. It's my favorite time of year, man. Yeah, I'm sure you got some uh, some fall colors popping out. You know, things are starting to fatten up. About to be harvest time, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Some giants are out there. It's uh, all over the you know all over the area. It's nice seeing pictures. People sending in. Uh, if you got them, send them in. Uh, but there's a uh, you know I call it raising giants. You know everybody's doing their thing. Everybody's excited. Everybody's you know it's got it's 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 an electric feeling. It's 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 the outdoor electric right now it's it, it's nice yeah uh, around here i actually cut down my uh my veggie garden for the most part the squash plants are done the corn's done uh the cucumbers are done <laughs> the strawberries are done basically the only thing left going is the watermelon and carrots i'm about so, the same place you are man watermelon yeah, uh, carrots you know, watermelon only- and carrots that's that's all that was left the squash was just completely Sugarcane. The squash was just completely annihilated with powdery mildew. Like I was like, you got to get out of here. I'm I'm not even going anywhere near you. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was getting bad. So I was like, that's it. We're we're turning it all into a big compost pile and starting over. So, what's going on with the rest of my panel members this week? Uh, Keith, Black Sale Market. How you feeling this week, buddy? Uh, doing very well this week. Um... My clones, some of them were kind of struggling in the arrow cloner. Uh, I've got all the best ones in solo cups. Um, So I've got at least one clone of all my plants. Um, Heading into week three, one of them's uh, just showing showing out over all her other sisters in terms of like size. Um, But other than that, it's kind of hard to tell which one's going to be the real standout in terms of like smell and frostiness. Uh, I'm hoping it's the big one, but... Yeah, man, it feels really good to know that whichever one turns out to be the standout, um, I will be able to work with again. Um, yeah, so it's always a good feeling that. having knowing you got backups. Hell yeah, man. Um, I just gave them some uh, fermented plant juice that I made um, from my uh, leaf strip, like at week three of flower. Um, and that's right about where they are now. You know, I took those leaves, made an FPJ, and uh, just now kind of got the opportunity to use it. I'm wondering if uh, any of my more advanced organic gurus can tell me like what the NPK might be on a fermented plant juice made from cannabis leaves. Um, seems like the kind of thing Mr. B should know. Um, but yeah, garden's looking fucking phenomenal. Um, the girls are loving it. I'm loving what this colder weather does for my temperatures. Um, everything's going good, dude. Just ordering parts and building lights. So speaking on that, I do not know exactly what that is. So basically, when you do an FPJ of your own plant, it's going to be whatever nutrients your plant has and whatever it's uptaken, right? It's going to be different. So it's going to be a different spectrum of what, depending on what you're feeding your plant. Uh, Cannabis is a heavy-duty bioaccumulator, so it's going to pick up pretty much whatever you give it. So depending on what you give in it, that's kind of the spectrum, spectrum of MPK values you're going to get. But ultimately, it's going to be like a higher nitrogen type deal. Um, I'm not really the person to ask for specifics on that. That is a good answer, though, because that's what I was going to say if nobody else had anything to add is uh, the whole point of like the fermented plant juices is to get whatever that plant pulls out of it like pulls out of the ground essentially as far as nutrients go. You're making that reavailable to, to put back in. Total agreement, man. You, know, if you are what you eat. Yep. Cannabis more so, you know, for sure. 
Yeah, man. That's why it's kind of why I waited until now to use it because I, I wrote down on the jar, like what point in their growth cycle, the plants were at when I took those leaves. And, um, I just, dude, I fucking hate throwing away a big, big giant ass bags of leaves. I'm like, man, this is my nutrients, dude. And like, I'm going to throw them away and then go to the store and buy more. Fuck. But what are you going to do? You can't have a big pile of leaves rotting on the top of your 10 gals. You know, true. you're in a small tent, you know, you can't be doing that. Yeah. If you don't got any out, outside space, everything I have, man, goes outside trimmings, old hash usage, stems, sleeves, it's either in the worm bin or just straight out into the garden, you know, into, into the orchard, whatever it's got, you know, always goes back, man. Me too. Everything just goes straight to my outdoor garden. I'll use all that soil yeah. next year. It'll decompose and be perfect. Right. So moving on down the line, Mr. Tenassi Gardens. What's going on, buddy? How you feeling? Shit, man. I feel fantastic, bro. Can't complain about too much, dude. Freaking fracking mushroom grow kits are going great, dude. I did an interview that's up on YouTube on Salt Bake City. We had him on the show. They've got me up there on an interview explaining some of the mushroom mycology stuff. Then, uh, not much, man. I'm just uh, on Cadillac and everything else, dude. I don't have any pheno hunts going or nothing in September. I got an elk hunting license this year, so it's dedicated to trying to get some meat, man. Not really uh, hammering down on the grow, just on keep it on Cadillac, keep the keepers going, you know. I got gotcha. you. But sometimes, further, sometimes you do, yeah. Sometimes you do got to just let it go and take care of life. Yeah, that's what I've learned this uh, last couple of months, man, is that I work, 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 and I never take any time for myself. And I've seen that take a little time for yourself, even though you're not being productive. When you come back, you're a little more productive than you were if you were just kept going, 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 push, push, push. I don't know. So I'm going to start making uh, myself take breaks. I've learned this month for sure doing this hunting thing. So without further ado... Dabs up, Mother Lickles. Hell yeah. Take a little time for Tanasi. I like that. Yeah, man. So. Everybody needs that, bro. Not just me. Everybody. Work, 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 work. Man, you got to take time for yourself to do something you enjoy and give yourself that uh, that moment of relaxation. Well, what's the, the old adage? It's like you work hard, you should, you should get to play hard, too. <laughs> I play too hard. I'm trying to be sober, bro. <laughs> 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 all right so we'll we'll touch back on that later i guess why don't we move it on down the line mr fumador from fumador and the flavors what's going on buddy how you feeling this week uh not too bad man i was gonna make a little tiny announcement but it looks like it's not quite that time you know what i'm talking about it's a fun little announcement but uh in the meantime uh not much man we're kind of dealing with the smoke and stuff here i realized today i was all sluggish i was like why do i still feel sluggish i got like some dental work done and i felt so much better i was like why am I still fucking dragging everywhere? And I realize it's because no, like, no matter where you go, if you go to the store, if you go outside, if you walk your dog, you basically smoke a pack of cigarettes with fucking smoke. Whatever. So we're dealing with that. But uh, otherwise, uh, I guess. Hey, but aren't all right. you wearing your face mask? Shouldn't, you know, that, man, take care, grow, shouldn't that take care of everything? kind of idiotic that my grow, like everyone's kind of staying at home. It's kind of eerie when you go outside. Like most people are staying at home because the air is so, so bad that a lot of people, if they can, they stay home. Uh, I think cannabis growers that kind of live among their grow have the best air in the city of Portland. Seriously. Like my air is still like not great. Honestly, I can kind of still smell a little bit of campfire, but it's nothing like even going upstairs or going outside just because I have a carbon filter and plants filtering and creating oxygen. So seriously, like that's kind of like this one little hidden twist or whatever. It makes me feel like uh, Matt Damon from the freaking Martian or whatever. Like yeah. growing my own potatoes or whatever, but I'm growing oxygen with. You got a little micro whatever. scrubber in your a little yeah, micro right? scrubbing climate that's in your house. Anyway, that's a fun thought. Let's end it on that. Yeah, man. Failing to think of something funny, so that's cool. So uh, why don't we uh, kick it on down to Mr. Bacillus? What's going on, Mr. B? How you doing this week? Doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. So I'm back at school now. So pretty busy with that. Just uh, finished up class about half an hour ago. So back onto uh, an online type uh, FaceTime deal. So uh, yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a good week. Uh, going back to check out my plants that are being dry farmed this weekend. So uh, really excited about that. Um, one thing I thought I'd bring up, uh, so I've done cuts now in the ground beside cuts 
in the pots. Obviously, you're going to get a faster trigger in the pots, but the resistance different from being in the ground compared to the pot, I don't hear people mention as much. And I'm seeing a huge difference in particular powdery mildew. And this is with zero application as a test. And uh, yeah, just to bring it up, yeah, so basically, let's just say uh, three out of five coverage of powdery mildew on the plants in the pots, and it would be about half of one on the ones that are directly in the ground. So that's with no application, just to show you the true resistance of like the natural microbiology just taking care of it. So just thought something I add on. That's interesting because um, you brought that up and I've just kind of been like screwing around on my own with um, with adding things like <clears throat> like borax and stuff like that to um, like a, an already made soil mix because I'm like, okay, they got all the MPKs figured out, but I was like, they're, it, it's probably still missing like the, the micros, you know, like all these like micro nutrients and, you know, things that it doesn't take up in very large amounts, it, it might be missing still. So that's interesting you bring that up. And um, I do have one pot with, you know, that's more heavily amended than the rest. And that one is just superb looking. So it, it does kind of correlate with what you're talking about. Yeah, it's really interesting. I gotta, I gotta look more into what it's all about. If it's more of a biomicrobial thing, which I think it is, or if it's, um, if it's, or if it's a cell wall deal, I, I really gotta look into it. But it's a really interesting phenomenon. Just looking straight in the ground and in, in kind of a super soil pot, just the resistance factor. But yeah. But yeah, I always notice. You know, your plants in the pots I always get sick first. You know, they're always going to get sick first. They're always going to get bugs first. They're always going to you know, have problems first. Um, you know, you got a lot like, you know, different mycorrhiza and stuff like that will like embed itself into the end of the root and things like that and actually create a barrier or a boundary that keep other things out. You can't get a lot of those natural relationships or a multitude more, I'm sure. Um, but there's a lot of that that goes on. But yeah, man, pots, pots are always the first ones to get, you know, always the first ones to get sick, man, every single time. Or if you want them to finish earlier or do something like that, man, it's always like throw those in the pots, let that ride, see what, see what happens, and uh, you can get them to trigger and finish and get stressed out and do their thing. But, yeah, total agreement with that. Cool stuff, cool stuff. All right, so let's kick it on down the way to Zen Premium Cannabis. What's going on, Zen? How you doing? What's up, everybody? Good to be here. Good to see you all. Good to see you, Tyler. Uh, we're, you know, we're chilling over here. We got some blue cheese and solar flare uh, drying up in the dry box. I just got another press. I had one before. It was kind of shitty. It was like a Harbor Freight, but it wasn't even a Harbor Freight, so it was no good. So I'm putting my low temp plates on a nice dig 10 ton, so I'm going to get some precision rosin coming out with all that hash I just washed. So, yeah, I got a lot going on. We're chilling, you know. Work never ends. Let's take a bong rip. Cheers. Hell yeah. Cheers. Man. Press, man. All right. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Rasta Jeff. What's going on, buddy? How you doing this week? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me again. I'm over here packing up seeds, uh, doing work, keeping business flow and having a good time. Ready to give some uh, good grow advice and input for our uh, organic friends. You oh. look sharp in that shirt, bro. Oh, thank you. Uh, a nice gentleman that I know may have may and or may not have given it to me. Looking good. Hell yeah. So anything on your guys' mind this week? I know I didn't I didn't really necessarily pick out a topic, but I figured we'd just have like some good organic talk. Uh Mr. B started us off with, you know, some of his uh what he noticed in pots and what he doesn't notice. Do you guys want to keep going with that or you got something else on your minds? I'm wondering about a collab with Irie Genetics and Family Tree. I think that would bring out some uh, interesting terps maybe into the outdoor setting or I don't know, maybe you could work in some interesting things there. I don't know. Definitely put some, uh, some Solomon jizz over on Pam there. That could always work. <laughs> I'm from the same era as you, bro. I'm, I'm a fan of Pam. That would be nice. They both got similar structures, you know, they're both, uh, you know, we got that sativa thing going on. So yeah. Yeah. Make us great. Some... That, that fiery lady for sure. 16 love, week know. flowers. Nobody wants you know, to grow up but us. Real weed. Real weed you know? Yeah. <laughs> For real. 
no question. I'm in. I'm in too, man. I'll get you whatever you want, you know? Cool. I like it. I like the sound of that. There you go, Mr. B. You ask and you shall receive. What happened? That's good. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely try those out because I'm, I'm actually trying to kind of set up right now uh, some selective varieties for my outdoor grow because I want to get a real outdoor growing going for my uh, single source hash, but I actually want to bank off it this time, right? Uh, in the past, I've kind of like just had my, I'm an indoor grower. I put my indoor varieties outdoor and tried to work them from there and then use bios to kind of combat disease. And it, you know what I mean? That's what everyone does is they kind of, they throw their indoor cuts outdoor and they bank off that, right? But I actually want some cuts that are really going to do me well in the outdoor. And uh, yeah, so so yeah, I'm, look, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for some selections right now to and to make a list of some things I want to work with. And uh, yeah, so how... Uh, how are your strains in hash? Like, how do they do uh, with different types of hash making? Uh, sorry, I'm talking to Mr. Trees. I know Rasta Jeffs is uh, really good. Um, the uh, most of what I I I breed I breed for grease and not sand. So, like, I consider like the two resin types, you know, a sandy resin type and then a greasy resin type. Uh, a lot of, a lot of my stuff is great for pressing. So if you're making like actual like washing hash and things, there's a couple of plants like, you know, my pan 15 and, you know, the, the bacon grease that's going to be coming out. All those are uh, do si -do cookies, sandier resin, you know, profiles. You're going to be the, uh, when with the pan 15, it's more of an open airy sativa bud structure that washes really beautifully. I mean, really good returns on the wash. Um, those types of plants will be good for that. But most of what I like is more of the grease, the can't touch me runny resin that's going to clog up your bags if you're trying to wash it unless it's fresh frozen. And even then you're going to have to go through, you know, clean extra, you know, above and beyond. So I find like, you know, any of my dog walker crosses, any of my uh, um, anything of the true Pam 1 stuff, like Pam 1 stuff, it's more grease. So putting it in the press, you get really, really good returns on the presses. Um that's something that I need to get, you know, more of too. I need to get a better press. I need to up my game in the press world. So I need to catch up with Oregon. With kind of I, I love my flour. I'll never stop smoking flour. But with some of this stuff, when I press, uh, you know, like the pandemic, you know, it's one of my it's one of my new crosses. That, that it's it, it's stellar. It's a triangle Kush Cam ninety one and my Pam. Basically, it it smashes like nobody's business. I can smash a Pam, I can smash a uh, do, -si do I can smash anything in the, the pandemic or the dog walker. It smashes just like my dog walker. So um, I'm sure a lot of people want to smash Pam, but that's not what yeah, we're yeah, talking yeah. about. <laughs> <laughs> she does. Yeah. She, you know, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, so it depends on the cultivar, I guess. Um, but I breed for flower first. I'm not a hash person, so I'm not breeding for hash cultivars per se. So I'm not saying, Oh, this is going to be, you know, going to make the best rosin or the best, you know, card, or the best, uh, you know, temple ball or whatever. I, I'm always looking at the flower first and I've always keeps bring I keep bringing it up everywhere I go, everywhere I talk. I want to, I want to get the, the, the charist game up in everybody's lives. I want to create these little, well, I have, but I want to make some better professionals. Anybody's an engineer, and they can make these uh, charis paddles, you know, some sort of like silicone gloves that, that are more like a paddle or, you know, some sort of a paddle where you can just go out and just start rubbing your, your flowers and harvesting them at different stages, the fresh hash, the old school without getting it all polluted with my dirty, dirty compost hands, you know. Um, I think that, you know, that's something that I really want to get into more uh, because just touching my plants, the grease comes off like nobody's business. So I think that the charis the charis way way of business might be the way to go and you might be able to get three or four different harvests off of that plant before you actually harvest that plant you know what i'm saying if you're gentle and, and good enough so uh it's something that i'm investigating but yeah i don't breed for hash per se but god damn it i can make some hash you know with my shit that's for sure well said well said Anybody ever do the Charis, Charis stuff? The, I've, you know, anybody I've ever never had the seeing? chance. See? I've I never had the chance to try it. No. I always thought about it. I wanted yeah, to, yeah. but I'm like, mm, maybe next year. 
Yeah. <laughs> hard, hard you laden those flowers, but you know, might be fun putting a pan under under pressure. All right. Oh, I was gonna say too. Also, I was laughing last week about your guys' clone game. That was uh, everybody's got a different different method. But I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring for uh, Dirtman and uh, Stabby's uh, uh, riot root cube, right in a little, you know, some sort of a gangster tub, and away you go. Um, the arrow cloners, I did those for a little while, and yeah, you you can run them, you know, off to the corner and the side. That works pretty good. But I always found that transferring them from water to soil, you have this, you know, you have this weird little little swank time. Uh, and I'm not used to having any transplant shock or any issues like that. So I, you know, I'm usually, you know, the way it goes. And sometimes when the water doesn't get changed enough or you don't run or cycle your pump, uh, then uh, basically, you know, you can um, fuck up your clones and then cannibalize them pretty bad. So the root riots, you're, you're definitely having nicer clones come out. I mean, I'm in, like I was just saying, 23% humidity right now, and it's 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 bad, and there's no problem with, with a little dome and some root rag clones. You Eight soak them, you just straight up H2O. Yeah. I dip them real quick in my water, and then I'll shake them out one, two, three. And that leaves them with just enough moisture for me that I'll put them in the dome with water at the bottom, right. and they'll be good. But I don't. That's just water. I sometimes I'll do it with microbes if I got some, but I'm not trying to. It doesn't. It does okay. Yeah, I love I love that layer of water at the bottom, and then obviously your root riot's knotted right in there. But it has that kind of moisture layer that locks in, and it makes the it, it very slow dry. So you're they clone pretty quick, and uh, that little layer of moisture they know exactly where to tap into, and it just it's a it's a very efficient process. Yep. Hmm. So, I don't know. I was gonna ask Mr. Trees, how long are your roots when you would plant them in the air cloner? And you could see issues, like maybe you muted. what you're talking about. You muted. You're muted. You're muted. There we go. Who's um, I could, I could just. Uh, it it really didn't matter. I I could I could just have a couple of little roots popping out or I could take it all the way to where I had a big mass of roots coming through. I found that the mass of roots coming through had better transplantability, but there was always, they were always more unhappy plants, you know, in the long term. you know what I mean? My, my water is not great and I'm not the best at keeping it clean and it gets too hot anyway. And like I said, I'm a soil grower. So if I was going from that into like rock wool or that into aquaponics i think that's perfect you wouldn't have any issue especially going from that to aquaponics but i i heard a soil guy you know do an interview a long time ago and he was he was saying the same kind of thing he was like if you're growing in soil you should root in a medium that you're gonna be stepping up in you know what i mean that your plant is used to because the fibers and the hairs and the way that the root forms in water compared to in soil or in a root cube or something like that is different and it has to adapt to that different environment you know if you're taking it from one place to the other so i grow in soil i want to be as close to soil as possible i'll take it right in a cube or right in a solo cup with dirt you know a whole bunch of them or a little egg cartons with dirt you can do it the same way half the time i use rooting rooting you know hormone half the time i don't uh just depends on if i have it or not but the key is to just you know just just get a healthy cutting off a plant, have a healthy plant that you're taking it off of and make sure that it stays, you know, in, in the, in the dome or the higher humidity. And really you should, you should have no problems. Um, like, you know, I can show you right now, like, I mean, well, like the, the clones you're looking you at know? on mine, right. I'll put them in the root riot cubes, just like you were saying with a little bit of cloning gel. And then when I have probably about an inch to an inch and a half of roots sticking out of those cubes, they go right into the solo cup with soil. And then they'll sit in that solo cup until I feel as though they've outgrown the cup. And then I'll transplant the cup into the bed. And then that's it. They're done. That's the last transplant they get. Yep. I went, like I said, I went back and forth and I've got, you know, I don't know, I'm, I might have eight or nine 
fucking clone machines, you know, in my garage sitting there piled up, you know, all these parts and stuff. And I just got so tired yeah. I, at first. Like, you know, I used to do it old fashioned. We used to do it, you know, and then I did a lot of aloe tech where I did, you know, just used aloe vera as my, as my brewing hormone. I did, I mean, I've done every technique under the sun and it just depends on how you grow the technique that you need to do, you know what I mean? And where you're, where you're at, like I said, if you, you try to stay as close to the medium as you can. And like, uh, there's just so much buildup and maintenance with, with the water cloners for me personally, that I just was like, yeah, I don't, I don't use bottled cleaning chemical, you know, bottled nutrients that are cleaners or these things anyway. So it's not something that I'm going to do. And it's just more practical for me to use soil. And like I said, every single time, eight, to 11 days if my plants don't have roots then it's it's a waste and when they're and, and when they have roots they look beautiful they're they're like you just cut them off the plant they're not you know they're not messed up or crappy looking or anything like that i mean it's no bs you want to i can send you a picture like you know directly i'll send you guys whatever of, of stuff that they're as soon as they strike they look beautiful um it's the clone machine i sometimes i had the the collar rot sometimes it would really discolor really badly sometimes you know there were just all these other things that came with it that you know i always found that i was trying to deal with it and i just i was like man as soon as i use the root riots because i don't like rock wool and i don't like doing anything like that so as soon as i found the root riot cubes i was like man i don't even need you know i, I hate spending money on stuff but if I'm going to do something that's important or that I know that I really want to keep clean and, and it's in a, like a commercial environment, then I'm, I'm going to use the root riot cubes. If I'm at home, I'll use friggin, you know, any soil that I have around Fox farm out of the bag, you know, yeah. dirt out of the garden, what, what have you, you know, comparing the root riot with the rock wool cubes. I, I feel like the rock wool cubes dry out almost too fast for me. Even if I do have some water in there, I feel like the cubes will be drier than the environment. Sometimes I'm like, Oh shit. And I, it gets ahead of me and i had the same thing with the, with the aero cloners i had two big ass aero cloners and they were like 100 site ones and it was a lot of maintenance for the small grow that i had so I, you know i have those sitting as well and they work great you're right those are amazing but um it's just not for me because it's just not the style of grower that i am right now they have a rainy ultimately they're ultimately they're water roots that you're producing when you make when you'd use the aero cloner and there's a stunt period like they do they're like it's a high success rate when you transplant the soil but there is a stunt period and uh but it comes down to i think like just what works for you right like it's no point to argue what works for you um one thing that i found well that i just it's pretty much common knowledge is actually um domes actually kind of came from the black market um, because it's all about kind of creating uh, a microclimate in a space where you're not, you don't want to control the whole area. And on a commercial scale, actually, like you can, like you can clone just by controlling the VPD of the room and do tables. And that's kind of the proper day with, or with misting tables rather, right? That's the proper way to do it on scale. And uh, yeah, just, just, you see a lot of LPs and they have, they still use the clone domes in rooms, but really you could, you could just run the tables. It's all about the VPD. Hit him with that golden VPD number, Mr. B. <clears throat> you're muted, RJ. Rasta, muted. you're muted. <laughs> Still? There right, you there go. There we go. Goddamn, I was muted in three different places here. Goddamn. Uh, nobody wanted to hear me, apparently. Uh, when we I always use... want to hear you. When I use the clone machine, uh, I don't have to worry about the dome and the V. They don't care about the VPD. They're just on the floor over there in the corner. Uh, and there's no maintenance to my clone machine. I fill it up one time, I get it going, and it just goes for me. Also, the reason I love it, and this is going to sound, uh, I don't know, I'll just get to the point. I train guys how to use the machines and teaching them how to open a clone dome for a certain amount of time every day, open it for 10 minutes today 12 minutes tomorrow 14 minutes open the vents just a little bit the guys don't give a shit to check on the clone domes i give them a clone machine i go check the ph and the ec of this every day then plug it in and leave it the fuck alone and then in 10 or 12 days i go transplant that into cocoa and we don't have any problems when i moved away from the domes the commercial girl was much happier so in a commercial girl i love the the fucking easy clone the turbo cloners uh all of the above they're awesome uh, i just got to have a guy to clean them all the time and 
Uh, yeah, it's so much easier than training guys to fuck with the domes. That's kind of an art. You've got to do, you've got to kill a bunch of them to learn that with the easy cloner. I, I've got an SOP that it will work right now. Yeah, my, I, I hated open the vents of the clone domes. And I, I, don't, I don't fucking do that shit anymore either. So what I do now is once the clones are ready and they got roots, I pot them up and I put them into their little, their space. And then they get misted with water. The whole space gets misted with water for that evening. I put them in right at the evening, at, at the evening hours. Usually there's other plants there involved. It, the humidity is already going up as it is. So it'll, the humidity will jump up and everything gets up. Everything gets misted with water for one night. And then the next day, they're standing straight up. No problem. No real hard knock period. And I use LEDs and stuff. So they're not, you know, sometimes they're harder on plants. Sometimes they're not as hard on plants. It just depends on the plant. But uh, that's what, that's, that's like my grow hack. That's what I've been doing for, yeah, for years. That's, a, that's like, super oh, important. It. So yeah. I'll have to do that halfway through the cloning process sometimes, even though I have a super humid environment, um, the, the leaves don't have water on them, like water droplets. And I feel like the water droplets literally go into the leaves because they don't have roots. That's how they intake the water is because that's, you know, human environment taking the water like that. So spraying, I'll be like, uh, I used to do it every day. And then I backed off a little bit. I'm like, right, I don't have to do it every day, but uh, it, it's super helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I always tell people with fruit trees, like, if it's dehydrated, it happens a lot here. You dehydrate your trees, it's hotter than hell, it's 100 freaking degrees, and water just gets sucked out of the ground like nobody's business. So when a tree's under stress or a plant's under stress, or you want to keep it hydrated and or keep it, the humidity up, yeah, the getting water on the leaves of the plant or food onto the leaves of the plant when the stomata are opening up at dawn or dusk. You know, usually those two times are peak, you know, and in the, in the early, early morning or late in the evening, those, the stomata and stuff are their most active points for fruit and other plants and trees, you know, for the most part. And if you're getting water on those things, you can kind of force feed them through those cells, right? Give them a, an IV drink of water, which they can take that in. And for young clones, I, that's where I, that's where I kind of stole that kind of stuff from is just like we, we spray, you know, spray trees and sick stuff that way just to keep the health and well-being. It's like an IV for a plant. So when I do that, I don't have to mess with, you know, opening and closing and doing all that, you know, uh, it definitely works. It helps um, something to try or, you know, depends on where you are too, you know, environments, everything. Tyler, uh, a lot of people in the chat, I think probably because we hear this a lot of times, are still a little bit paranoid or even people that I run into are a little bit paranoid about um, doing foliars, even, even in veg, even as seedlings, even as uh, relatively big plants. And then especially in, in flower, you tell them, oh, you could spray water on the plant or whatever. And they're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. A, why would you do that? I mean, you were saying that you do it for a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but I mean, in a nutshell, why would you actually spray water or even plant food of some kind, organic food, obviously juices or whatever on the plant? And is it good or bad? I mean, obviously you're doing it on purpose. It's probably good, but I mean, people are always asking like, oh my God, that's terrible, it's horrible. And of course, I guess maybe even the third question, when is it too late? Because there is always a time when it's too late to spray juice or anything good really on a plant, right? Like worm teas and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, so um, with any, so with cannabis, first of all, as soon as, it, uh, as soon as you go into flower and you're starting to have any substantial hair development at all, you know, week one, I consider no more sprays, period, of any kind. I don't spray anything. I don't spray water. I don't spray mold killed i don't spray anything i don't kill anything um nothing on the flowers once we're in bloom um up until bloom total another story S some plants um that are bred in the greenhouse situation that are you know heavily you know inbred and humanized i like to say uh some of those plants don't tolerate a lot of foliar you know sprays and pressure because they've never had to deal with the outside environments of rain and other things that are just grown for productivity and other things. Sometimes those types of plants are more susceptible to, you know, mildews and molds and things from getting sprayed with water. You know, um, there's some tomato diseases that if you spray water and it's an uncovered little soil and the soil splashes back up onto the tomato leaves, you can get different types of tomato blights and, you know, tomato problems that way. But the, the point is, is basically, um, 
spraying the plant, I feel like is good. Washes off bugs, washes off eggs, cleans the plant, gives them a shower, just like all of us appreciate mm. uh, for that exact reason that we were talking about before, force feeding the plant. Like you can, if you do it at targeted times, you know, usually it lights out is my, is my favorite time uh, or in the evening if you're outdoors or whatever early in your in your growth cycle from you know as soon as it's got two or three sets of leaves you know and it's becoming uh, a young a youngster with a little bit of something under its belt i can start spraying it with you know water it'll strengthen the stem getting its you know getting its butt beat a little bit you know um you can start spraying yeah, instead of instead of cracking and popping it you just spray it with water yeah or just you know just beat it up a little bit i mean just you know expose it to the world you know don't don't baby it so much um, I mean, can, Jibran Ali here says, uh, seems like a recipe for disaster. He'll never spray anything on his developing buds. Well, you actually said that you cut out in week one. Yeah, there's before no even week one. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's, no, there's no real pistols to speak there's of. No, there's, there's no disaster. There's no pistols. Yeah. There's nothing really to be harmed, right? Nothing to be harmed at all. So it's just you spray beforehand. You know, you're having fun as the plant's developing. Like, like I said, if you have a, a day your plant's stressed out or you're in a small pots and it's not getting watered very well, a good time to, to spray water or something on your plant would be that. It lights out. You can spray it down with a little misted water on the leaves, on the undersides of the leaves. And when those stomatas and things are open or their best chance to be open would be at that period in time, you can get some water into those, into those leaves. You can use a light like kelp or worm casting or something if you want to get a little food in its belly but once you get a little water and a little food in your belly you can start turning on and doing some stuff and you can you can kind of resume action so i use it as like a little a little kick in the pants a uh, little little extra kiss it's not something that you have to do every week or every couple of days or you know every month for that matter it's something that you know, every once in a while, you should give it a little something. Uh, and if you're spraying something, I don't ever worry about actually getting the plant wet as long as it's not in flower. Um, as soon as it starts to go in flower, I stop doing all that hubbub and anything that I do do is in the soil. And it's usually not even, nothing there is happening either. Everything I establish, I establish before I push the plant into flower. And then once it goes into flower, it's pretty much on its own. It's gonna start cannibalizing itself unless it's a really long flowering plant, it's going to take, you know, 16, 18, 20 weeks. And it really needs this extra, you know, plant. If it's not planted in the ground, then I'm pretty much not going to do a whole bunch of extra stuff while it's in flower. I'm going to let it use up what it has and uh, finish out its cycle, you know, its cycle uh, for the most part. But beforehand, it gets loaded up with, you know. I mean, there's there's also something to be said, honestly, for, I wonder if you agree with this, there's something to be said for a plant that could kind of take a little bit of aggressive, you were saying, you don't baby them, and there's something to be said for a plant that can take that kind of almost mild abuse, where you spray water on it, honestly, too late, I mean, plants outside get rained on all the time, uh, now they, they, they're they getting smoke and ash around us, then they're going to get hit by rain, and whatever else, and some people's plants are going to survive, I guess what I'm trying to say is, that's a sign of a probably... Uh, a durable, you know, as a breeder, a durable genetic line that probably has really good terps and everything else, no? Uh, we were talking about that before. I, that's one of the things I do to lots of my plants, you know, while they're in flower, the ones that are getting tested, I actually spray them with a hose or mm -hmm. I leave them out in the rain or, you know, any of those things. I, it, I try to I try to increase the likelihood of them rotting or getting messed up. So it kind of tells me which one is the stronger one of the group, which one rots last, you know, and all that stuff. But as soon as as soon as my plants go into flower, they're babied and protected from the, you know, the elements. They get, you know, they get, a, you know, screen or a, or a hoop or, a, you know, no sprays for the, for the most part. You know, I try not to damage or, or get the buds wet in any way or the developing buds in any way, you know, for any reason. Um, it's it, if you start spraying for something, you know, and you're in week three or week four, man, that's something that, in my opinion, you probably could have avoided, you know, before even getting to that point by, you know, uh, you know, putting a healthy plant into bloom and or, you know, preparing a plant to go into bloom properly. You know, um, you should never have to spray those things unless you're in a really crazy environment that it rains every day. But then I wouldn't be I, you should be growing inside and you still shouldn't be spraying. So there's never really a reason for, in my opinion, to, you know, ever spray it when you're in flower. Uh, but, but beforehand to help sick plants to help clones along, to give a quick kick in the pants, to force, you know, yeah, I'll, 
I'm I'm no stranger, and I'm not really particular. I'll mix up, you know, pretty. I, I'd scare the shit out of a lot of people, like, especially Ross and Jeff. You know, he likes. You know, he he's he's very you know commercial, meticulously organized, and you know that's that's super important. But I'm really rough around the edges when it comes to that. So I'll dump certain things in a bottle and I'll spray it. You know, and it's. I've got an art to it and it's just timing is, is, is very important to me, you know, so flower, no spray, not that. I spray the fuck out of them in flower. <laughs> Up until what week? Depends on if I've seen a problem and what I'm facing. Like if, if I know that there's spider mite, if I've got a room that's in the rooms are usually staggered by about three weeks. So if I'm in week six and I see spider mites in another room, we'll consider something. Uh, if that room in week three shows me mites, we'll consider an option in week six. We may just have to do something. Uh, some things you can spray late. Some things you definitely don't want to, but yeah, I'll spray the fuck out of them. Sometimes I'll just spray them with uh, just push in week six. Just put some push on there, make them get a little chunkier, maybe a little bit of CalMag if they need it. Like, oh, I'll spray the fuck out of them. I'm, I'm not scared. Uh, okay. I'm a breeder. So let's, I'll go into detail. This is some shit that I shouldn't go too far in, but I'll share my life with you. I have plants that uh, are seeded. They're filled with seeds. I'm not worried about the buds at all. Sometimes I'll spray the fuck out of those a week eight or nine, just so that I make sure there's no pest problems. I'm spraying the other plants. I'll hit those while I'm at it. Uh, when I harvest those for the seeds, they just get cut down. They dry out. I never see any mold, any problems in those plants. They got sprayed all the way through the full cycle, almost up to the last week of harvest because I never intend for that flower to be consumed. The flower gets thrown away. Here's the seeds that came out of there. So there's nothing going to be smoked. I could spray it right till the end. I feel comfortable. I never see any mold, any problems with any of that stuff that I spray uh, almost to the very fucking end. And they're chunky buds. They're buds, giant buds filled with seeds. What and they get sprayed. Spray in? Uh, a, I've got a huge Eagle rotation. Uh, Eagle 20. Um, what's the other one? Uh, Avid. Um, uh, Back no, in the day. Uh, Liquid chloramines. The, no, it's uh. The... Oh, go ahead, brother. I'm sorry, I'm cutting you right off. No, I said back in the day we used to, uh, you know, when, you know, in during all the house grows and stuff when we were when we were kids, uh, we used to spray the flowers all the time. You know, neem oils and things for friggin' boytritis and all kinds of stuff. And you can spray the flowers, and you know, the 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 buds would you know be beautiful and good and pristine, and there's been times like just for me like i know that i've looked under certain ones under a microscope and sometimes depending on the pressure of spraying you can see you can see the damage there's some stuff that just doesn't go away it is on it is right. what it is if, if if it's my weed and i'm consuming it i want nothing on those flowers no matter what from from moment one but yeah when you got them seeded too I, that's something that i don't worry about i have all kinds of issues i'll spray them during seed no problem keep them clean finish them off straight to make sure that they're good and go, you know, that will make it through flower if, if they're outside and, and have, you know, insect bud worm pressure or, you know, any other types. I mean, granted it's in organic stuff, but sometimes if you have to push something along, you can do those, especially those longer flower and things. That's no problem, but yeah. I was going to say I'm, with everyone, I'm with burning. everyone breeding these days, like everybody and their uncle's uncle is breeding uh, too, not just professionals, but amateurs and amateur amateurs, and everybody else. Uh, but they probably should remember too that they should maybe avoid spraying some of the weird shit like Eagle 20 and whatever else we yeah. discussed because that can actually permeate into the seeds, believe it or not. You might think, oh no, this is safe. It's just, it's, it's a plant. We're not going to smoke it, but it's a freaking seed. It needs like right. 15 generations or whatever of half-life, right? And I'm just joking when I say I use, use Eagle 20. I've been using yeah. that uh, and they don't pay me to say this. I've got some of that mammoth uh, pesticide, the stuff that yeah, mammoth the made. Oil. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it smells real nice. It leaves the room smelling real interesting, and it seems to work. Uh, Dave's over there giving me a sign of disapproval, it kind of looks like. I alternate that with some uh, with some <laughs> Azimax. Then I use a couple other things. Uh, just Evergreen. Dinosaur. He's just a little tyrannosaur. Yeah. Yeah, the the, uh, the thyme oil, you know, that's a good that's a good principle. You, all the, like, I use a, a lot of different oil sprays for fruit trees and stuff. So, like, there's thymes and peppermints and uh, neems and uh, mineral oils. There's a thousand different... It, concoctions rosemary garlic there's you know all these different oil concoctions right and different percentages of different oils affect different bugs or affect different you know spores and affect different things but the thyme oil that's one of those things that you know oils are a suffocant you know if they get on something they're going to kill anything that can suffocate it and then they're also that that 
that terpene profile will do some repelling and things for future things. So it's not, it's not a bad product. You know, I just, I, have, I can't, you know, I don't, I don't have a commercial zone and I can't spend money on mammoth products. So it's not, you know, they're too expensive for what, for what the time is for me. So. And you often actually, we were talking about this when you came on uh, the, the, the chronic table, like you're kind of dealing with ag amounts in many cases, like you actually do tree stuff, you know, like not just the little tree stuff where it's, you know, 20 trees or whatever by law, like you have orchards with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trees. You, a bottle of such and such rosemary oil is probably not going to cut it. So you have to figure out other ways to deal with it, right? Like more, so to speak, kind of durable, sustainable ways to deal with your kind of pest problems, no? So there's like, um, there's the higher level, like usually sulfur is an organic thing that will take care of a lot of fungus, will take care of a multitude of insects. If it has to go beyond sulfur for me, uh, then it's not my job. It's not a job for me. Um, some, you know, it's, I think that improving the environment around it, you know, all those other things that I would implement, you know, for care, for, you know, mulching, for, you know, the, the feeding, you know, regime, those types of things would fix a lot of the issues and would turn off the stress beacons in the house of whatever was going wrong and anything that it didn't fix or couldn't, you know, ev you know, evict any insects or any, you know, pathogen that had his hands in, sulfur should, should take care of most of those things. So um, if it's got to go beyond that, I don't think that, like I said, that's not my job. Um, somebody else can do that. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'll try to go a different way. But um, if I do do, even then, even if I use like a sulfur or, you know, a bunch of, you know, oils or different bacterial sprays or any, any of those types of things. Um, I always am re-inoculating afterwards uh, with some good beneficial stuff, you know, um, you know, some sort of a, a, a gangster compost extract, you know, you take a handful of compost, throw it in a sock, throw it in a, in a bucket of water, make some brown water real quick. Just that wash it, bottle, just like a quick wash you know? with it. I yeah. Hear you. Just take, take what's in that, in that handful of dirt and, just spread it out and then put it, you know, back onto the plant itself without changing it or, or messing with it or trying to alter it or breed it or, or do anything. Just take what the good is in the bag and put it directly onto the plant itself. And then, you know, that usually is good. Then I don't have to do that. You know, I don't usually do much after that. And uh, you can solve a lot of problems after a good sulfur tango. You know, you're spraying with sulfur for a little while and always try yeah. to re-inoculate, you know. You're not the first person to come on the show and tell us that, like, if you're going to be, you know, spraying oils or something on the plant, it's actually a really good idea to go back maybe, like, later on and go back with, like, a compost tea or a wash or something. You're not the first person to come on here and say that. So it's, you know, it's definitely been echoing in my head and something I should really probably get into doing more. No, that's refreshing for me to hear, you know, because that's something I, you know, that's, that's just something I do because anything we, anytime we intervene with anything, we're making, you know, we're, 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 we're hurting good as well as bad. So um, just try to throw a bunch more good guys in there. Um, if you're just doing it non well, you are, You're like a sandstorm or something, way. right? You go through there with your sulfur and you wash away everything that's living, you know, you wash away all the good and the bad and everything else. And who yep. likes to move into kind of vacuums, right? The bad guys like to move in first. So you have to make sure that the good guys are there first. And then when the bad guys roll through, they're like, oh, this, this is already well protected. We're going to find somewhere else. Right? Exactly. That's kind of how the principle works. It sounds exactly. stupid, but it's, it's basically plausible. It's logical. Right? Yep. Exactly it, man. So nine, nine times out of 10, that'll, that'll fix a lot of problems, you know? So yeah, that's where something like an IMO would come in perfect. An IMO from that property. Yeah. Come back. Yep. So what is an IMO? Because a lot of people in the chat don't know what in the earth that is, in my opinion. What is that? Uh, indigenous in microorganisms. Yeah, go ahead. You, yeah. yeah, so basically, uh, so it's a Korean national farming practice, what I'm talking about. And uh, pretty much you're collecting microbes, different species of microbes from the forest. So... Uh, yeah, you're basically, you can collect it on various things. And uh, yeah, these, these microbes are going to help fight off of various pathogens. Uh, they're going to help uh, unlock nutrients. They're going to help your plant uptake nutrients. There's, there's so many benefits from these IMOs. And uh, they can be a flat foliar or root drench uh, made into like a, a shelf stable version. So it's a great product. And it's basically 
uh, fighting pathogens with your indigenous good guys. And uh, yeah, you pretty much go to a healthy forested area on your property uh, where you can find these really good beneficial strains of uh, fungus and uh, go from there. It's also a lot of fun, especially if you're into like nerdy, like science project shit, which I think a lot of organic growers are and just growers in general, because you're using like a, a jar of rice water to collect your microbes and then you add them to like milk and the milk gets all separated into like kefir and renette. It's almost like the first step in cheese making, you know, then you add your molasses and shit. And uh, if you're not careful, you'll, your jars will explode. It's a lot of fun. It definitely is, dude. I I tried making labs at my house and I fucked up and oh boy, did it fucking smell bad. Oh man, my fucking house stunk for two fucking days, dude. <laughs> it was bad. That's the other good thing. If you're wondering at the end if you did it right or not, it's like, bro, if you fucked it up, you would know. Yo, seriously, it was like it was like dirty feet and parmesan cheese, dude. My house stunk. <laughs> So yeah, that was uh, that was not a pleasant experience. Well, so I guess I go. Uh, I guess it's a good thing we're growers and have carbon filters and inline fans, then, right? <laughs> Trying no, to get all dude, that the, smell out. The whole house. At least just, try. <laughs> two days, dude. The Man, whole I house. I normally don't even reeked. use my carbon filter. I, I feel like I've said this before because the the, the terpene thing. Like I have this whole theory that the, the plants. Uh, overproduce their terpenes, whatever. They're trying to rebalance something that gets sucked out of the atmosphere. So I just kind of, because the air circulates in this environment, I just shut off the carbon filter months ago, I don't know, probably a couple of years ago, to be perfectly honest. And, uh, you know, I've had it all this time. I just don't, never fucking use it, right? Unless maybe once in a while when the crop got way too stinking, I was like, this is too obvious or something. But it's been super helpful with this. I turn on with the, with the smoke storm, basically, because it's you can't even see across the street and everything else. Like it, it has to be bad for my cannabis. It has to be bad for me. So it's been really helpful to have a freaking carbon filter. And then on top of that, like I've said before, it's not a joke, like fresh air produced by plants. How awesome is that? Yeah. Now, if only you had a, like a little bonsai forest, mm -hmm. that would be, that would be That's ideal. Next Dude, if this, if this is like a yearly thing, I'm going to have to make like a whole wall of cannabis flowers or whatever. Wouldn't that be the shit? We were, uh, I was out in the back of my orchard watering a bunch of uh, the trees back there, fixing a couple of things. And uh, it was in the evening time and the sun was going down. And my wife, she's not she's not a big plant person. She likes eating fruit. She likes she appreciates them. But she's not, you know, she's not she's not like me. Um, she came up to the orchard <clears throat> to do something to get my, to get me to come down or whatever. And it was just like that magic hour, you know, where the sun was going down. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't too cold. Everything was well watered and the plants were breathing and the whole the whole shebang and all the trees were finally you know big enough and she's like wow the air feels cleaner and and like refreshing up here is that is that weird and i'm like no that's that's awesome that's why i'm up here that's i thought that i was weird you know so it was nice to you know it really is that that the oxygen the air the extra stuff that your plants create even if it's inside in that small place you know it, it really does you know, it, it creates a lot of people haven't it's had great. that experience, right? Like, really, it's yeah. funny to think that a lot of people really? haven't had that experience, even no, gardeners. It's, yeah, no, it's, it's weird. It's weird, but it's that's where you're supposed to be. It's all of a sudden you're at home for a few seconds, or you're walking through the forest by yourself and it's really beautiful. And you know, you're like, you have that moment, you know, to yourself that everybody has, you know, and that's like, that's all of a sudden that's it you know you're you're connected that's where you're supposed to be. You're, you're back at home, you know what I mean? I don't know that anybody, you know, who hasn't walked through a forest by themselves, hasn't felt that way time and again, you know? So, you know, that's what I got. You can, man, you can emulate some of this. Maybe if you don't know what we're talking about or whatever, I, I oftentimes, one of the, my favorite times of the day, sometimes I stay up super late or wake up early, whatever, just so that I can be awake when my plants go to sleep. And right after they go to sleep, they create that nighttime air. I think they're sighing off. There's, I'm sure, far more sophisticated excuses for what they're doing. But I just really enjoy the smell and just the kind of, I know that my plants are kind of going to sleep. And it's just this beautiful experience that I get to kind of share with them. I don't know if they're aware of me necessarily. You know, they say that cannabis is kind of present. But in the meantime, I'm aware of that smell. And I think it's a fantastic thing in general. But also it can show you that kind of transitory nature of the forest. It's not, not always forest you first of all it's not always day and night 
But second of all, it goes through different cycles through a day, not just through an entire year with the leaves falling and coming and going, but like they create oxygen in the day. They create the carbon dioxide in the nighttime a little bit, small degree, on and on and on, right? It's a really interesting thing if you can be present with it and enjoy it. I don't know. Absolutely, man. I think that's where the whole Zen part of it comes in. Wouldn't you agree? That's it. I know I agree, baby. Bong rip. It's nice oh, to yeah. hear some other, some other people say it. You know, it's nice. That's it. You know, that's it. Speaking of uh, things that smell awesome, um, a couple months ago, I put an oversized carbon filter on my six inch inline fan. I've got a six by 24 carbon filter. It's fucking huge. So the thing's kind of blowing like it doesn't have a filter. Huge. On there's some uh, there's some concern about the smell, but uh, in uh, coming up at the end of three weeks in flower, the room is getting nice and stinky. But the rest of my apartment so far is not. So far, she's holding up. So and uh, that extra oh, yeah, ventilation dude. did a whole fucking lot of good for my temperatures over the summer. I was very grateful for that. So we'll see. But so far, she's holding true. Also, before I forget, everybody remember switch from top chat to live chat, and if you're enjoying the show. Please remember to hit thumbs up and hit subscribe. Hell yeah. And to all of you out there that have bought the EO merch, dude, we greatly appreciate your, uh, you know, your patronage and you're helping us run the show and you're getting something in return. Can't, you can't, you know, go wrong. It's a win-win. So anybody that's interested, Tanasi has been posting the link in chat and it's also in the description in the video. So. Thank you again to anyone that's bought merchandise. <clears throat> so what's else on your mind tonight, boys? I mean, dude, you, you guys have got it rolling, man. Really like where this is going. Hey, well, I had something People keep up. asking us about... Uh, oh, go for it, Sam. I was Well, in the meantime, just so I finish the thought, people keep asking about uh, Harvest. I don't know if we could talk about that. Go for it, Sam. Kind of on the way there. We got some cold fronts coming up here in the Northeast. People around me are like, oh, man, you got 38 degrees, 36 mm. degrees coming up this weekend. What are we going to do, man? What's going on? My plant's going to die? Well, like, didn't Colorado already get hit with snow? Like, yeah, it's it's got cold quick, you know. Let's... Right. Like yeah. three days. We're back to normal, though. Yeah, and the plants are rather resilient. So. That's what I was thinking. I told a lot of people around me, I said, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, especially if it's not even freezing, they're probably going to be fine. The worst yeah. that can happen is like you lose a leaf. I mean, our, hey, we... our, 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 uh, I can't talk. Our outdoor <laughs> ah. <laughs> in Colorado this year that did get snowed on was, but they're very well established plants. So they weathered it just fine. We, we did have the typical like, rebound of 48 72 hours but um, we, we experienced virtually no loss so we're good yeah here we don't get we don't get below 38 for very long for many days at all if at all um so they'll hit 38 you know for one or two days no problem you know you can tolerate that they might be a little a little slouchy you know a little cold if you can keep them a little you know keep them up off the ground or something um you know, that helps, but they'll tolerate that no problem. But if it's all the time, then they need, yeah, they need warmer temperatures to be happy to be productive for sure. Um, they'll tolerate that for no, I mean, I, I'll have plants out until next year, you know, uh, all over the place, especially if they're on the, on the coast or whatever, they'll be, you know, February, January, they'll be outdoor plants sitting out there in full unprotected, nothing that's getting eh, 42 degrees, taking it just fine. Uh, enjoying it, you know, so they're tough when we give them credit for. Yeah, we'll take them like up in Wisconsin. We'll take them out. We'll we'll watch the weather and we'll we'll let them go through like the first like couple freezes of like middle October is when it really starts to get hairy. So we really start to watch the weather around that time. But yeah, I mean, end of October we'll catch that first real hard freeze and. Pull everything down, man. I mean, you just, you know, you're out there, you're seeing your breath, you're feeling the temperature just crash. And 
You're just pulling plants. It's wet. Out. It's wet and cold. You're doomed. Wet yeah, cold, you're doomed. Yeah, pump, yeah, wet and cold all done. day. Yeah, you're done. <laughs> Dry and cold is everything, you know, but wet and cold, you're done, man. Just pull it's it rough. Down. It's and rough. You get, to, hopefully you get there, you know? <laughs> I, mean, we, I mean, we we try to push it as far as we can, especially with the outdoor stuff. So sometimes you're, you're risking it for the biscuit for sure. I mean, just it is what it is. Let me get a biscuit. Oh. Uh, Yes, Dave, Dave brought some rosin over. Some Pedro's mm. rosin, baby. Mm. 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 Creamy goodness. Let's rub that right in Keith's face. Well, I was going to say, uh, Rasta Jeff, I was, I was listening to your uh, grafting um, episode, and uh, I would like to uh, do, like, we, we should do some tests on uh, on the cannabis and things like that, because the shorter-lived plants, like the tobacco and the cannabis and things that are not a woody fruit tree, um, might give us more information sooner on what really happens genetically, you know, on the genetic movement. Uh, but, you know, the grafting's been going on for thousands of years, and I personally take care of multi-graft trees all over, and you can definitively see the <clears throat> characteristics of the fruit that they're supposed to be uh, on the regular tree compared to the, you know, a grafted tree with that same variety on the, on the plant itself. Um, and there's probably, I've always thought this myself, I've been kind of in a weird agreement with you there, like that there's like probably some sort of genetic movement, you know, like your arm or whatever. You, you got two foreign, you know, um, pieces, they fuse together, they become you, you have some sort of genetic movement. I totally am like, I'm, I'm in total agreement that there's gotta be something to that. Um, but like the noticeability and like the flavors of the fruit that are 40, 50, 60 years old that have been grafted to this one tree are definitely individuals um, and definitely carry those traits, whether or not there's some piece that, that's like not detectable or not measured as, as scrutinized as cannabis would be. Uh, I would probably, I would probably agree with you. There probably is some some sort of a fusing whether or not that affects the fruit quality in any way i don't know um but there's you know like i said there is definite like isolation between the the graphs themselves and being cannabis and being like green and woody not not woody um shorter lived all those types of characteristics bioabsorber uh all these other types of characteristics i would think that that would tell you a more definitive answer pretty quick if there was a paper or something that some some college kid or something wanted to do or that's like there's something that should be should be explored uh on 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 that regard so i just wanted to you know point that and throw like that at you, dude. do so, the experiment bro you do well, it have, you've got the cuts and i, I got three kids bro <laughs> <laughs> he's got he's got time to work on plants but he doesn't have all the time in the world yeah he's got his own projects he needs to clone himself kind of like you too yeah i could use a clone but then i gotta feed the fucking thing oh well yeah that's a bill in itself isn't it <laughs> uh shameless plug since you said bill i've got an auction going on cannabis that ends in about 40 minutes so if you're on cannabis jump on cannabis check out that auction i've got going one ends in 40 one ends in an hour and 40 get you some rarities and some gems on cannabis Hell yeah. And if you don't know what Cannabuzz is, Cannabuzz is an app for your phone. You can get an iPhone, Android, doesn't matter. Go to your app store, type in Cannabuzz, download that, make an account, go hang out with a bunch of cannabis-friendly people on a cannabis-friendly app. If you go to Sacred Three Mushrooms on Cannabuzz, I'm doing a giveaway this month that will end on the 30th. Follow the instructions from my last post on Sacred Three Mushrooms, and uh, I'll make a drawing on the third, or actually be the first of October, and we'll uh, give away a kit. Nice. Oh, speaking of uh, cloning yourself, Cascadian Grown, uh, shout out in chat, uh, just made a really good um, point. If you were to clone yourself, you got to buy more dabs, too. You got it. Your clone's gonna want to try and smoke all your stuff, so uh, that that might be a problem. Got to maintain the gimp. (laughs) 
So uh, you got to stun them at a young age. With the yeah. extra income offset, the dabs and food that it's going to take, do I have to house it like a normal person, or can I keep it in like a, you know, can I go get in your kennel? Does that shit work cage. for my clone? Can I do that? It's my clone. Yeah, go get but your, like, go get in the closet. I, I don't know how he's your clone. You, so what would you do? Yeah, how would you react if you did that to yourself? Oh, it's not myself. It's my clone of myself. It's the one that's been rendered simply for productivity. If it's a clone of myself, I'd be taken over. I'd be like, no, we're going to do things this way and that way. It'd be, a, it'd be a battle, you know, from hell, you know, so I don't know. This was in Calvin and Hobbes, like several times he cloned himself. I don't know if anybody else remembers reading that shit. It almost feels like a Rick and Morty episode unfolding in front of us. <laughs> it's funny. So we had a um, we had a question from chat. Raptor Grow wants to know, uh, Mr. Trees, what kind of composting methods do you use? What's your what's your favorite way to compost? All right, I love this one. Um, basically, the best way to compost is the old fashioned way. Uh, they say three by three pile of mass, like a three by three pile of mass. Uh, you know brown material brown and dead green and wet brown and dead green and wet for about three feet by three feet that's the minimum amount of mass you need to pile up this material in order to generate heat to start the composting process um, what most places don't tell you is you need more than three feet because it'll start the compost process at three feet but once it heats up and cooks a little bit it shrinks down a little bit and then you're below that three foot mass and then it slows down and doesn't cook anymore it doesn't finish out so then you're in with hey my compost just sits there and never changes so you need a five by you need a five foot pile so what i do is i went to home depot i'm lucky enough to have a backyard or a place that i can you know put a couple pallets but i went and got um a few pallets from home depot i uh, stood up a pallet you know on its side for the back and I stood up a pallet on its side for the for the side and I made two you know a little cubby and I made another little cubby right next door to that and I you know I screwed them together so that they just are these freestanding little open cubbies and uh, I, I took two other pallets and I just move them and put them in front of the pallets to make a door because you need to move them out to shovel the, the, the material so you can't put a door on them you can't make them complete boxes because you'll never be able to flip it properly so basically a three walled box um, right next to each other. Uh, I take all the, all the brown dead weeds or dead material that I have around, little small branches, anything that's brown and dead and crunchy and brown can go in the carbon pile or the carbon portion of the pile. So underneath some cubbies, like a small thing that may make a difference, may not make a difference, uh, but underneath, so you got your little cubbies, you got a cubby here, you got a cubby here. Underneath those little cubbies on the ground, they sit directly on the soil. I dug them out a little bit. So it's kind of like a little, a downward slant, little, you know, a little downward slanted, you know, dip in the, in the ground so that it catches more water and water and stuff can kind of pool there. And it just, is, it's kind of a half ass hole is all it is just underneath each cubby there. Um, and I just fill that up brown stuff and then a bunch of green stuff. So all your weeds, your green weeds, anything that's green, all your green leaves, uh, kitchen scraps, um, anything that's green and wet, uh, manures, uh, like chicken manure and stuff like that. I consider green and wet if it's fresh, if you got a chicken coop or something, uh, and you're using like their, their bedding or something, I consider that green and wet, even though it's brown material with chicken poop in it. If it's fresh chicken poop, it's, it's, it's hot and it's fresh. So that's, it's a, it's a different source of nitrogen. I consider that wet. So we, I use that as wet. Um, I just add more green if I can. If I'm using chicken poop, you just got to add more more green stuff, you know, to kind of compensate. But you'll figure that out. But basically, you need a five foot pile of crap: brown, green, brown, green, brown, green, and you top it with brown. And then you hose it down as you're building it. If you wanted, depends on your climate. And you're really dry, you would build. You would hose it down as you're building it. If you're a moister climate, then it doesn't freaking matter. Just hose it down when you're done. You know what I mean? It really just, you know, you're good enough. Um, once you get to that point, you can't really add anything to it. So once you get your pile built to five foot, you're not going to take the kitchen scraps that you had stored from tomorrow and put them on there and keep adding fresh material to that pile. You need to let that pile go. 
So once it reaches five foot and it's layered in that fashion and it's moist, all of a sudden that, you know, by the next day, um, it will heat up substantially. It'll be over 100 degrees by that next day. Two days later, it'll be really hot, 160 degrees, sometimes hotter, depending on what you're putting in there. Um, sometimes depending on your climate, what time of year you're doing it, that will affect the temperature. But basically, once you organize it in that five foot fashion with that with that ratio of things, bang, you've got you've got the compost machine turned on and that will cook down and then you'll still have enough mass to finish out the process uh, of the compost. And within, you know, a, a short amount, a matter of weeks, six, eight weeks, um, sometimes longer depending on your climate, sometimes sooner depending on your climate. It's really based on what you put in and how you're doing it. Uh, but after about two days of it heating up, you're getting it started, you got to flip it. So you take it from that one bin that you have, that one little cubby, and you flip it to the friggin' bin next to it. And you let it sit there. So you take the stuff that's on the, you know, the top and you make that the bottom and you just flip the whole thing and you move it right next door to that other cubby that you've already got pre-made ready to go. And you let it sit there and you hose that down and you let that sit there for another few days. And you just, you, you repeat that process back and forth and every time it becomes beautiful and every time you'll see smoke kind of coming out of it and, and it should smell nice, it shouldn't stink. There shouldn't be a lot of like flies or, or, or bad types of, you'll see bugs and things inside of it, but it won't be, there won't be flies like flying around bothering you like in masses there, it won't stink and, and smell foul if you're doing it correctly. Uh, it doesn't need to be covered up or it should be able to breathe. And, and that's what the slats of that that pallet also provides is, is those breathable, you know, walls. So um, that's how I do it. It works great. You can add that to anything. Um, it's one of my favorite ways, the easiest way to compost those tumblers. I worked at nurseries and stuff. That's sh that shit don't work. Stop. Don't buy that. I don't care who you are. You send me a picture. If you got something that works, it, most people turn those into worm bins. They work fine. You can do it. You can do that. No problem. But anything you put into a tumbler, uh, one of those tumbler composters or a little kitchen compost, something smaller than, than a three by three mass of material usually is just sludge uh, and isn't like pleasant. You, you, would, you would never want to like jam your hand into it and pull out the my stuff tumbler. I bought a tumbler at it. Costco. You're not fucking around, man. It's the worst purchase yeah. I think I've ever made in gardening. It's garbage. It was hard <laughs> to put together. It cost yeah, yeah. like 300 bucks. Now I don't know how to take it back to Costco because it's so big yeah. and it's smelly now and everything else. And it's band. a fucking eyesore. Worm bin, bro. Such a disaster. Sorry to interrupt don't you, but it is literally it garbage. Band. Please don't buy that. <laughs> no, it's garbage, man. I sold, you know, I sold them. I, I discouraged people for years. I've seen thousands of them at, at different places and different houses. Every single one looks the same. They slide this thing open. They're like, look at my compost. And you slide it open. And it's just like flies everywhere. And it's just sludge, this this just sludge that never changes. And it's just the most they always end up leaking. thing ever. They always end up either too wet or too dry. They're never yeah. in the middle. They tell you it'll be in the middle. And then there would be a licky hinge. Like if it weren't made like garbage, then it would be okay. Because basically I put it together, right? Like I said, it took me forever to do it, but I put it together, right? And wouldn't you know, it, it leaked immediately, basically. Yep. Well, it's yeah, but it always comes. It always comes back down to, to the mass, and you've got to generate enough heat to, to change that material properly without getting those bad pathogens to want to live there. And when it's all wet and nasty, those the bad guys are going to want to live there. There's less air in there. It's not working fast enough. It's not heating up. It's not changing fast enough in one of those things to be doing it healthfully, you know, in a, in a good compost way. So even if you did get something to come out of there, it's probably not going to be the, very good compared to like a pile sitting on the ground that's been flipped over and over again. And like, I've done it billions of different ways. I've seen it done billions, well, hundreds of ways. I mean, you know, practically, uh, and the best way is that five foot pile, um, five by five pile and a garden hose, man, with your, with your weeds. Don't worry about putting friggin' weed seeds in your compost. Boo hoo. Number one, if you're farming properly, you should have a bunch of mulch on your surface of your soil. You should be fungally dominant. Uh, there should be no purchase for those weed seeds to want to grow because you know you're practicing good healthful environments. Uh, worst case scenario, a couple weeds grow, you got a couple roots where you needed them, and you can cut those weeds down, throw those in the compost, and away you go. Uh, but really, if it gets hot enough and you do it properly, you're going to kill off anything above 160, 100, 165 degrees. You're going to get a compost pile that heats up to boiling water, basically. You put 
a seed in the boiling water, you know what that does to it. You wouldn't buy a pack of, of you know, pristine cannabis seeds and throw it in a, in, a, in a pot of boiling water, you know, let them sit in there for a little while and then plant them and expect them to grow. And they were in a freaking pot of boiling water. So that's, you know, that's basically the way I look at that. You know? So does that be... That basically, like you're saying, that would like bake the seed to the point where it's not even going to germinate. Well, yeah, I've never, I've never done that, to tell you the truth. So I'm, I can't tell you that it doesn't work, but I wouldn't do it thinking that, hey, I'm going to fuck up the seed because I'm cooking it, you know, and I'm going to kill the germplasm inside. I can't survive in over 120, 130 degree temperatures for very long, you know. Um, once you get up to 160, I don't think most things on, on earth can. That's why you're, that they call it composting. So it's, that's the idea is to kill off stuff. So once you get to that temperature, things die. So I would assume that, yeah, you know, if you do it right, you compost right. Like I said, it doesn't stink. You don't have flies, but you got a dedicated five foot pile. And that's hard to do some places, you know? So it's like, you might as well just buy a bag of compost if you live in an apartment or, um, try to find a way to contribute in a different way to a worm bin would be your your magic machine you just you could do that out of a cooler or a, a you know a box a couple of grow bags whatever worm bin would work for you if you were in a, a small space and didn't have a place you could pile up a bunch of crap but if you got a backyard and you got a neighbor's tree that throws leaves over there and you know you got weeds that grow on the fence line man you got you know you got free compost if you just you know spend a little bit of effort you know, for sure. Throw a little elbow grease into it. Preach, yeah. man. Uh, I hate to say it. I hate to, to admit this to the audience, but my wife does that all the time. She just apparently cannot be convinced. She's constantly strip mining the soil of all the weeds and everything else that comes out and putting it in the yard debris bin so that the city can make more compost that we end up buying every year. Basically, it's kind of absurd. But uh, I mean, like, I does it too. heat that stuff up and kill the seeds, kill the weed seeds, basically. And again, like weed is a relative term. You know, we call cannabis a weed. It's whatever you call something. It's just it's an unneeded plant, an unwanted plant. Right. But anyway, the plants themselves don't know necessarily they're a weed. But all you have to do to kill any seed, like you say, is to freaking compost the, the heat compost it, basically. That's making proper compost. Anyway, you're basically doing the right thing. Anyway, you can make it with basically any plant. I mean, I guess if the plant were some kind of toxic plant, one of those piri piri whatever plants in australia the, the the biting plant or whatever yeah don't do that but other than that man you can basically compost almost anything well you nope. should it goes back it goes back to the imo thing that you know mr b was talking about because that's indigenous microorganisms to your area right you spend a lot of time harvesting the local dudes who are going to do a lot of the good in your area that live well through those climates if you're composting your own weeds and your local stuff, you know, from your area, you're getting all those microbes that live there in your compost pile already. Uh, and on top of that, the weeds that you're composting are full of all those minerals and those nutritious elements that you're, you're trying to put back into your soil because that's their intelligent design by nature. You know, that's basically what happens is, is they're supposed to be there to take, they'll send, like if you're in really hard clay soil, they'll send a heavy taproot down uh, as deep as it can to, to capture the calcium and the other minerals that fall down low and then it returns that calcium and the other minerals up to the surface into the leaves of the weed you know plant or whatever plant that's growing and then it dies and returns it to the surface to 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 do that whole process over again so by using the weeds you're actually mining the minerals that are deep and unaccessible to your plants and then being repurposed and, and groomed and the, they're your soldiers uh, for fixing your land for what your soil is missing. So like if your soil was missing this mineral, you've got to feel the weeds there. They're actually doing what, you know, your soil is missing. They're, they're functioning that way. The only reason they're there is to source those minerals that your soil is lacking, cover the soil surface, drop the temperatures, and then die and cycle and put roots in the ground and, and, and catch those minerals that, they're, that have fallen. Uh, so once you know, once I mean, that, if you're using hold your own on weeds, for a second there, that I think people don't appreciate that. You're, like you're when good you to look go. at weeds in a yard, there's some of the healthiest plants that anyone has ever grown in their garden, right? Like almost any gardener will kind of admit to themselves shabbily, like oh, the fucking weeds are happy, happier than my plants, because they're there basically to mine the stuff that your garden isn't. I mean, I, you can look at it a different way. Uh, the stuff was there, so they showed up and they grew it. Basically, there's not some kind of intentional behavior to their 
to their being there, like a bird probably pooped that seed out. But anyway, the plant had to mine its own minerals. You know, nobody spoon fed that weed, like nobody spoon fed a dandelion botanic care or something, right? In the history of never. So, I mean, like that, that dandelion had to create its own life from the rock and the soil and everything else. It's, it's, uh, it's a useful plant to kind of pay attention to, no? Yeah, absolutely. Any of those 100%. Weeds. It's intelligent. So I, I encourage everybody, like tomorrow, go out into your yard or go out to wherever there's, there's plants or weeds growing, right? And pull up the weed. If it's got a big tap root and it's hard to pull up, right? Chances are you look around at that soil, it's going to be very compacted, hard clay like absurdly dead soil right and that weed's job is to penetrate that earth to break it open and send the root as deep down as go if you walk up and you pull that weed and it comes out really easily and has a really shallow you know root system that's just this fibrous net basically it's trying to grab the sandy soil you know that's that's there that's occupied and pull that soil together onto the surface to create you know some sort of structure so depending on the structure of your soil depends on the type of weed that's going to grow there. And then depending on basically what is native and in abundance and resilient that mother nature can kind of throw at that area. Those are the soldiers that are sent there. And that's how, that's how you fix, that's how you fix the system. Uh, you let her, you, she sends the proper soldiers to the area. You just got to deal with, you know, you just got to deal with, um, um, you know, nasty look of it for a short period of time. If you do it you know, completely right, or you can kind of manipulate it like you would any type of grow situation to kind of help your soil system kind of come back alive, you know? Pretty cool. I mean, it's a weird way to think about it, but yeah, it's, yeah. Weeds are not my enemy, that's for sure. Yeah, so I Someone was told- Someone like, said there is no weed, that's Zen. There is no weed, only water, grasshopper or something. Yeah, no. weed. Weeds are only bad if you think they're bad. I think that's what the, along the thoughts that they're going on. It's like all plants have a purpose. Yeah, it just ends up being like an undesirable plant for your purposes. You know, if you had a permaculture garden, you might even consider some of those kind of native plants useful in some way. Maybe they'd be cover crop part of the year or something. You know, I don't know, whatever. And I'm just kind of bullshitting, but, uh, they serve purposes in, let's say, grasslands. Like if you want to rehabilitate kind of a, 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 a chopped down forest land or burned out grassland or whatever, you would actually want all those plants to kind of naturally seed. And they do go figure, they seed themselves. And then a few years go by and sure enough, we've talked about this before, the plant succession, the bushes come in and the trees come in, whatever else. And all of that's kind of at random. A squirrel goes and forgets they left a nut there. Oop, a tree grows there a couple of years later. But again, over time, the land rehabilitates itself. You know? Oh yeah, um, I would like I talk about before. I was reading uh, Steve Solomon's book, The Intelligent Gardener, and he said that um, dandelions are actually a source of um, low calcium in your soil. Like they actually go out seeking calcium, and I'm pretty sure Tyler was touching on that earlier. And like if you have a lot of dandelions in your soil, hit it with some calcium and you you actually might not see that a lot less you you'll probably see a lot less the following year yeah definitely like uh any 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 weed that has a taproot is is looking for calcium first and foremost it's chasing the calcium that's one of the heaviest things to fall so um chances are if it if it is a, is a heavy rooted plant um with the taproot you've got very clay like soil which is binded up all of the, the available nutrients in that in that fashion so uh a calcium you know supplement or something those things intuitively knowing that adding the calcium to the surface you know ahead of time will speed that freaking process up exactly what Dan's saying Andy, exactly so yeah and you know what else would help st bernard's touches on marketing he says uh, if they called crabgrass elf grass then everyone would like it if you called dandelions dog flowers or something everyone would try to grow them in their in their yard on purpose right or if you call them happy citrus uh, vitamin C plant or something, people would grow them instead of just dandelion. They'd chop them all and down. Speaking, you know? of, speaking of dandelions, I got a question, right? So, like, if I were to convert to Rastafarian, would I be a dandelion? Would I be dandelion? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Too clever by half, man. 
No, not even we got one Rust. I think we need two to, to get it. We need a second opinion, literally. So we've got to wait until Rust the Buff comes on to say I or nay. I, I think they're probably going to say nay on that one. Just <laughs> go ahead with your jokes. <laughs> But whatever, I thought it was funny. I miss the thigh slapper, don't get me wrong. But it's just heard in everyone's ear silently. Wah, wah. So, uh, what's this? Aussie CC says dandelion roots make for a healthy tea. See, like a lot, a lot of people don't know that there's um, plants all around that have medicinal values. Sure. There's a uh, per- personally. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I actually want. Like I wanted to go grab. I wanted to go grab a book. I was gonna. I was gonna use to make my point. Trying to get weeds, a fire so yeah, we can see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. The weeds that grow around my house. I I ended up learning when I first moved here. You know, I'm like, it. It turned out it's purslane. So I have purslane and nutgrass, and those are the two most obnoxious weeds at my house. But purslane is like this super nutritious, antioxidant rich super plant you know and i had no idea and it's like very got succulent leaves and they always have this false purslane that has that grows nearby and and you got to learn the two when you start looking at this up um but really it's super easy to identify it grows like a freaking weed uh it's extremely nutritious uh antimicrobial i think is a big thing uh, but it grows everywhere and covers the ground really quick like like you know um good ground cover uh, it's it's bitching um and normal people pull it out and throw it away all the time but it's it's great to throw in you know uh the composter or just to let it grow in places or to be it always pops up in the in the pots of my plants because i use a lot of recycled soil you know just a big pile of soil i'm always recycling and mixing and and adding new stuff too and kind of mixing around um and weed seeds flow in there and it's always got a bunch of uh you know uh, purslane seeds are always popping up but then i can use them as little cover crops and they're tough because they're almost succulenty, and uh, you can yeah, kind of snack say, on it's them. It's kind of a half clean. succulent. I, I don't know that I've seen too many of it up here. I'm sure people probably have it in their gardens. You know, they grow everywhere. They're weeds. Gardens. They're like a common but, weed that you see everywhere. You know, it's like I, here yeah. in California, for sure, you see them everywhere. I've seen them in Arizona. I've seen them. I think it's a weed that grows everywhere. I think it's one of those. It's one of those that grows everywhere or damn near everywhere. Um, you know weed. where people are. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that's where nut grass is like the grass everybody always came into the nursery to kill because it would invade their lawn, and it's like just this really bushy, tight clumping, fast growing grass, and you can actually eat the nut. It's like this big root nut, right? It's underneath that the ancient Egyptians or some ancient peoples used to eat. Uh, it's nutritious, but it actually makes a, a bitch in lawn, right? So like. At my house, my whole, all my lawn, any of my lawn areas are just nut grass lawns because they are tougher than any regular grass that would regularly die or take a shitload of water. And it's a weed that everybody would kill anyway, but it's just such a cool grass that wants to grow there. I just encourage it to grow there. That's my lawn. And everybody's like, wow, you got such a nice lawn. I'm like, I don't do nothing to the lawn because it's just, it wants to be there, you know? So I always encourage people to learn what the local crap is growing in their yard. And sometimes you can. Well, yeah. speaking of you know? well, perfect segue into the book I wanted to go get, like learning what's locally around you is, dude, Peterson Field Guides, Edible Wild Plants. And then they make these specifically for like different areas. Like this one is like Eastern and Central North America, but like they make them for like all different areas. And it's a, you like my bookmark? Got a little plant growing out of it, but like these are really nice books to have dude it's only like 20 bucks to pick one of these up and it dude it fits in your back pocket you could take it backpacking with you like learn something new while you're sitting around the campfire instead of just playing on your phone or something like that you know what i mean like you can you can very easily identify things in this book like some of the you know like the photos in here are they're beautiful color photos it's very easy to identify what you're looking at they have like really well drawn out like diagrams of like what is what like and then there's there's like recipes in the back it's a really handy book to have ever since i found these i thought they were like everybody needs to have one of these for their area 
but that's the the Peterson Field Guides Edible Wild Plants. And that's then just find book. it where find it where it's at for your area. Yeah, I love I love stuff like that. I always try to get that that um, you know the local book. What's what's around? Little pictures and diagrams. That book in particular that you have that that series of books are awesome. Uh, Dude, these really, are really phenomenal. Um, once really I got are. once I got a hold of this, I couldn't put it down. Yeah, a lot of those medicinal you know weeds and those weird books that you see. You know, some of those are pretty cool, man. Uh, and there's some cool stuff in there. And then you can double check and it's you know it's there's some cool stuff um so definitely something you should learn you yeah like here. like perfect example i had like the bookmarker was actually on like fiddlehead ferns and you know like what ones are around here and stuff like that we yeah, actually we have like ostrich head and stuff like that it's pretty cool yeah you learn and then you're like you know then you figure out what that plant is rich in or what it, what it's doing there you know like mm -hmm. what type of root system it has, you know, what, you know, what, it, what its whole reason for being there. And then you can kind of tailor your soil um, or add things like you were saying uh, to kind of kickstart the process, you know? Yeah, man. So cool. Knowledge, man. Weird knowledge. Nerd stuff. Uh, this is total. This is total nerd stuff, but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm all about it. When it when, <laughs> honestly though, I really feel like if anybody that goes out like camping or hiking, dude, just bring one of these along. You you never know if you're gonna if you're gonna be starving on the trail one day. There you go. Perfect example. Uh, Raptor grow taking a native plant ID class next semester so yeah i mean if you have the ability to go get hooked up with university have somebody actually take you out and teach you that's even better than having a you know than having a book in your hand yo dan look in your book and see if you can find uh hercules club just tell me if it's in there hercules club yeah okay just Take, take are they scientific name? I don't know if that's scientific or... name. It's just like the 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 local. Is that like a gardening dick joke, basically. We can Google that. We can figure out what the, what it is. Tickle tongue. I can't. I, I'm. I got that's... you. Yeah, there Hercules you go. Hercules Club. Yeah. Is this uh, this amazingly uh, Latin name <laughs> that uh, <laughs> I would love to pronounce, but I would just screen share it. <laughs> So uh, the only reason why I ask is you're on this topic is I, I, I was out in uh, Northeast Texas, up north of Dallas on some property I'm looking at acquiring. And a good friend of mine who actually is a, bio, who was a biology teacher for like 35 years, pulls me over to this tree and says, oh, this is Hercules Club. We call it Tickle Tongue. Um, scrapes off some bark, scrapes off some more of the bark, hands it to me, says, put it in your mouth. Tell me what you feel. I uh, popped that sucker in there. Boy, was it bitter. And about a minute later, I couldn't feel my face. Like a scrape? Like you just scraped yeah, the yeah, right there? Yeah. I could not feel my face. Like literally. Like I was salivating like a mother and I could not feel my like face. Novocaine. That's wild. No, I don't think we have that around here. It's pretty It's pretty native up in the, the north uh, northeast Texas, north Texas. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's not around here either. I can tell by all the surrounding plants. That's not something I've, I've seen Pepper around here. Toothache tree. Tickle it's tongue. bitching though, man. The toothache tree. Uh, yeah, pretty cool, man. It was pretty cool. So it's like they a natural some... Novocaine. Yeah, it lasted for like a good 15 minutes. Wow. They have these yeah. like button, they have these like uh, button plants that uh, that grow around here that they, I forget what the hell they're called, but they're, uh, they call it the toothache plant um, around here at the nurseries. And it's basically this little flower and you chew the flower and it makes your mouth numb and it, and it helps. And that's what the, the so like little, like little yellow about. golf balls. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're, all yeah. right. So they're indigenous, not golf to, balls, but like little marbles. Yeah. Little they're in, they're not quite I'm golf pretty balls sure yet. they're indigenous to this area. There we call, we call them the Bristol buzz buttons. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We call them the Bristol buzz buttons. Uh, they, like they, they grow all over the place around here sounds like a nascar competition up there in bristol <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> Dog, yeah. bang on bristol buzz buttons okay 
Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm serious. They're these little yellow balls that grow on this like giant bush. And it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen like the Upcat Center, but that's kind of what it looks like. It's like a really weird, like bunch of tiny, tiny little spikes coming out of this like uh, little, like little yellow balls. And supposedly if you make tea with them, like your lips go numb and the whole, the whole nine, like you get the whole Novocaine effect. But yeah, around here they're called the Bristol Buzz Buttons. Yeah, there's all kinds of radical plants that do just, you know, it, it's, it's cool. I mean they're all around you it's weird nice. since no one's else so, is uh, freaking talking right now uh he didn't show up for the show but uh I, I know he likes to watch reruns so i just wanted to say dr scrambles who is a loyal uh, watcher of the show he happens to be uh, growing some golden go right now super cool cat it's his birthday today so i hope he watches this and uh Cheers, buddy. Let's look at the camera. Cheers. Happy birthday. Yeah. Happy motherfucking birthday, brah. That's it. Happy oh, birthday, yeah. man. Hell yeah. I'm a read one watcher myself. I love that. There you go. Hell yeah. I'm gonna pack a bong just for you, Dr. Scrambles. So Good idea, man. anybody anybody outside right now? Anybody got any anything out like out in the great outdoors? Or is everything protected yeah. in this in in these little boxes? I can almost reach my neighbors' houses on all sides of me, so I don't grow outdoors. Yeah, they can yeah, hear yeah. they they can hear yeah. me. They're watching the show yeah, just yeah, yeah. by yeah. Yeah, it'd be blowing them. I mean, literally they're they're smoking it at this time, you know, that the, the smell just blows right right into their window, man. They're there's a middle school a that. few blocks uh, middle school <laughs> that way, high school that way. And there's traffic constantly, so it wouldn't last. It just yep. wouldn't yeah. Yep. Yep. I used to live by the beach, right, you know, right in Ocean Beach and it's like right near the super, beach. Super boy. Um basically uh super high traffic i was in an apartment we had a little little teeny yard like this gangster little yard because we had dogs you know it was small but it was this little yard and i had that thing fucking packed full like like 40 or 50 fruit trees all in pots and then what other space was there was you know you know it's cannabis and the room for the surfboard or whatever but it wasn't it was all plants the entire thing you walk out the back door and you like walk in the fucking plants and you have to like navigate out and like nice. what you're saying is like fucking it's pretty cool but yeah it would stink up the whole neighborhood moral of the story you know it, you know because it was yeah high high traffic man but outside man got some uh, some dangler. monsters yeah what and do my you guys uh, recommend <clears throat> not a cough in the microphone what do you guys recommend um as we're kind of wrapping up you know there's uh, smoke up and down the west coast what do you guys recommend for people who are kind of dealing with ash or smoke or whatever as the harvest season is kind of wrapping up some people uh my friend cambesian is pulling some stuff down uh, uh well his uncle trip is pulling it down this weekend some people are pulling down you know a couple weeks from now so what do you do to prevent your your plants from just getting messed up from this we don't know when the smoke and ash is going to end so Man, that's uh, that's heartbreaking. I, uh, you know, um, that's something that number one, if you're outside and you're like right next to the fire and you're getting black smoke, you know, and stuff saturating your area and your plants. I mean, that stuff, you you know, it's hard, it's hard to get rid of. You know what I mean? And you're pretty much, you know, you're pretty much in trouble this time of year. You know what I mean? That's you know, that's soot and that stuff. It's it's that's scary. You know, so um, the really ash. Off that right? I mean, it's nature. It's fucking yeah. everywhere. You can't really like a greenhouse with filtration. Yeah. I don't know what, what else. That's really it, off. right? Yeah. So if you're really in that yeah. soup, if you're in the soup and it's black and it's and it's nasty, you know, my heart, my heart is out to you. I don't know what what That's you can a do. Shitty you situation. Some, yeah. If you don't burn down and you can kind of manage a crop and kind of get you know get your plants as healthy and as durable and as strong as you can, uh, the the leaf blowers or whatever the reverse blowers and stuff to to blow off the 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 crop as best you can um for the ash but if you're close you're in trouble and you're looking at bioremediation or oil practices to try to save whatever you can kind of save because i don't know what what soot or you know car, you know what what is going to be that i don't know i'm not yeah. i'm not so, can, be. um uh, rad daddy in chat i think he kind of summed it up he goes man you just gotta forget about it <laughs> like yeah. i can't i can't it's just like yeah it's pretty much it it's you're gonna 
you're going to read, you, you can't completely forget about it if you're those people because that's that is that's what we got to do they gotta they got that's their life no I, I understand that's that's a lot of people's but, livelihood but yeah that's you're you're in a bad 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 or their bad, medicine bad, for bad, the bad, year bad, bad. Don't the worst that. place possible you know um so if you're not someplace where it's like black smoke and it's not horrible and you're like la pollution you know smoke then i think you're you're pretty much you're pretty much good to go especially if you got a greenhouse or a hoop house something that's at least got some immediate cover you know what i mean from from the top i think that, that anything that i put in the flower outside so everything's outside but anything that actually goes into flower gets covered up with mosquito netting or greenhouse plastic or something just to cover up the plant uh mosquito netting has been my new favorite thing because of the the moth uh bug worm problem that we have and i don't like spraying my flowers you know so that's that one. That's the one thing that I found that works really well. But that doesn't repel moisture uh, in like the dew hours. So like your moisture can kind of collect on that mosquito netting if it's too close to your plants and kind of get those buds wet anyway, which could cause a problem. So if you're going to use the mosquito netting type tactic, there are ways that I set it up to where it sheds the the water and it makes sure that it's far enough away from the plants and it works pristine. Um, but if you're in a real moist environment and stuff, then a greenhouse is your best way to protect that stuff. And if you weren't and you were full uncovered, your leaf blowers, your good health, your um, practicing your my, microbial diversity, but you're keeping wind moving on that crop and over that whole area as best as you can. Pop up fans, friggin' your friend with a beach towel. I mean, fucking keep the air moving, man. That's the that's that's what I would suggest. Uh, if you were in any smoke situation, but you know, the black of the smoke, the, the, the worse the problem, uh, no matter how long the time. Yeah, it's been pretty, and, pretty rough for a while now. I'm worried that everything's getting yeah. cold smoke, basically. Yeah, so I mean, I'm we're lucky enough, we don't have any fires directly in us. Every year, we usually burn. I've, I've had fire where I take pictures from my backyard and there's flames ripping. You can see, um, not too far off, we've had the car filled up with all my chickens and my dogs and i didn't want to chase fucking chickens around and put them in a, in a trip back of a truck you know what i'm saying it, so it was real it's been real a few times um i know what it's like but we're lucky this year so far and we don't have any of the smoke and we don't have any of the 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 stuff happening where we're at you know which is nice um it we're not in the, out of the woods it's usually september october is our our time when it turns up it starts with them and then it ends up down south uh, by us. So uh, our time will come, but usually, you know, plants are done and, and taken care of by, by the time we're really in trouble down here, which is nice. So my heart's off to anyone, but it's tough, man. It's not, it's not hard, but you gotta do anything you can, man. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta do whatever you can. But there are some cool bioremediation tactics that they got where they can clean up some dirty ass stuff if you're in the worst of it, you know what I mean? It might all might not be lost if, if you get it in the hands of the right people. You know what I mean? So there's well, hope. I, I, I imagine think. it. I imagine it as if I have a hoodie on and I go sit by a campfire and that little bit of smoke gets on me and I go home. I, that hoodie smells like smoke. I imagine that's the same with the buds getting beat down with the campfire or the smoke from the fires. I don't know if there's... I claim it to like a pest infestation, bro. It's like the luck of the draw. You mean, I mean, not luck of the draw because you could probably convert for pests, but nature fucked you. And I mean, that's, I don't know if there's any saving that. And I don't know that I've never experienced a fire outside of crops, though. I don't know if it, I, I imagine it would soak it up and smell like a campfire. It, yeah, it's no, it's no good if, you, if you're actually that close, but you got to think about how close you got to be within the region of a campfire, you know, to get the smoke going. So it does fill the air, and you have. Well, I'm sorry to say we're going to have away, to solve this get, problem. Get this is, this is something we have to solve because this is going to be an every year thing now. It goes very like, far. Literally like, an every year thing. The yeah. mountain fires in the mountains of here, they go all the way past Denver, yeah. like I-25, like all the way yeah. up to Fort Collins. And that's that's a lot of long, long fucking range, bro. So I imagine yeah. the same in fucking Oregon and California. So, yeah. I mean... Yeah, I know. I, like I said, like he, it's made me. It's made me realize some shit out here because, like, I grew up in the south where, like, we might have a fucking flood or a tornado. That's about it. I you I can survive a fucking hurricane. I guarantee it. I can survive a tornado and a flood. 
a fucking fire, if you're deep in the woods, if you don't get the enough warning, like your ass is dead, dude. You can't outrun that fire. I've been down some mountain roads. You can't go very fast down. I just you heard can't outrun. Were, I just heard they they like uh, up by the. I don't know exactly what lake, but it, my wife said it was one of the lakes we we camped at. Uh, they said that the fire was surrounding them, and they were forced, and everybody was near the water camping on the water they said if it gets any closer we're going to force you into the lake you know so they were going to mm-hmm. force people into the lake uh because the fire was coming like that you can't fuck with fire dude that shit you know they, yeah there's not <laughs> you know, but, yeah. Yeah, there's nowhere to go if you're boxed in you know you, you know, get trapped in a corner yeah it's gonna be bad i spend every year i spend time with the garden hose hosing down perimeter doing weed and and like debris control around the perimeter of my my house because we're in we're in fire we're in fire zone my dad's retired firefighter you know um so he got paranoia instilled in me you know in weird places so but whenever that fire is close man the first thing I've, i do we're like fire and i check i have this fire alert thing i check the fire boom how close is it and then i start hitting my roof um you know, I got an old asphalt shingle roof, you know, so we we're, I always start hitting my roof and then I hit the orchard and all those types of things. And I always, <laughs> you know, I always, uh, try to install sprinklers and stuff on to the, the roofs of houses and things. Um, if, if you can, to try to get some sort of sprinkler or something connected to some sort of a, uh, a rain tank or a tank of water that's, that if they cut the power, you can just like pull the rip cord and like, It'll run out the tank, but it'll drop water onto the roofs and things. That's a cool thing that, you know, crazy people do, you know. Um, but, yeah, fire is no joke, dude. It's, it's, it's crazy. I was actually talking to my army buddy because he lives up in the mountains. And we, we went and looked at this land. And this is when the largest – this is the largest fires Colorado's has this year. And we, this is, we went and looked at this land. It is so thick, dude. You couldn't see through it. And I was like, man. And the road to get there, we were on it for an hour, and it was like 10 mile an hour, like fucking rocking and rolling. And there's people actually living up in there, bro. And I'm just like, man, if it caught fire, bro, you're like, there's no way you would roll down this road fast enough. It'd be bad. And so I asked him, because he lives up in the fucking mountains as well. He actually got evicted last week for just a couple of days, and he went back. But I was like, what can you do? And he's the same thing. I can empty out my well and my uh, reservoir on my property and soak it as much as I can. And I was just describing the other one, like dig a fucking hole and make sure you have enough air down there for fucking a day or 12 hours or whatever. And that's about it. I mean, because what else are you going to do? You ain't. It's bad. Every, everywhere I go, I dig, a, I dig like a six foot deep hole. And I put all my important shit in there, like my genetics, like a copy of as much shit as I can put in. And I put it every place that I've got, I go. I try to put, you know, I try to put some shit in the ground so that, you know, if 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 it if it fire rolls through or anything ever happens, you can always go with the treasure map, dude, and just be like it's seven <laughs> circles to the left around this thing, you know, if I can, you know, and, and do that. So there's that some wild ass shit safety, out in the yeah. world, bro. So I love it. You know, weird fire stuff, dude. So if your weed does get stunk up with a fire, um, is that something you'd still be able to salvage maybe by like doing an extraction? Yeah. They, yeah. They're doing like these bio remediating where they're taking contaminated pesticide product and cleaning it off and making it usable and, you know, some fashion. So I'm sure they can find a way to strip it and clean it and use something. It's, it's um, actually, but you're gonna you're not gonna make as much money and they're gonna do a bunch of processes and you know you gotta give it to the right people and it's not you know I don't know I don't know anything about you know the scale of what what that is it's, it's gonna be but it's not that ain't good it's not it's a, yeah. it's a lot harder to remediate yeah um, that out of yeah. the material than it would be like a pesticide or other other constituents smoke it just there's so much in it It, there's so it's so fine it ranges from the smallest particles you can imagine to you know shit you see with your eyes it's it it, smoke is a crop killer not just for cannabis in almost any agricultural sector smoke is a crop killer isn't it isn't it it still organic though so like it's it's carbon so like it it, it's hard it would be harder to 
be detected than like a chemical pesticide would be, right? Is that like and what you're getting why, at? And that's why it can be more difficult to remediate out because the steps you have to take to get assurances that you've got everything, it, it, it's, it's costly, it's time consuming, and the, out, the, the, the output product is maybe not worth it you know I, it's, it, I've, we've, we've experienced it with some cbd products like in, in the prior years that did have some smoke damage that were in close proximity to fires and you just you, it's just it's just so gonna hard. have to put that smoky it's, uh it's, smoke flavor on the terp name i mean, I mean you name can do it like crc tech and remediate the color <laughs> which is usually the biggest issue because it's a colored thing but uh the flavor yeah. and everything else. It's Eight, just, ten. Uh, Nine, ten. It's too difficult. It's too difficult. So it is difficult. Like, if you make like BHO with that shit, it'll just, it, it'll taste <laughs> like a campfire. Well, here, here's the thing here. Okay, so the, the smoke from the woods damages it, right? What if you went and got some cherry wood or got some of this other type, different type of flavor wood like these Traeger did? drills do and you re-smoked it to make it taste like some type of really good flavor and then served it as a smoked hash now now we're talking now we're talking because they got smoked bourbon baby come on maybe maybe that's what you know that's how they do like tobacco they smoke the tobacco and, like, yeah baby you just maybe gotta re-smoke it you're thinking maybe, wrong you're thinking you, wrong oh my bro. god maybe you're on something bro. Problem you don't have to re-smoke it to what you want you somebody will come up so we have to we have to sacrifice another crop to burn another crop to smoke this crop over with to make it smell good we got to burn a bunch of more weed over this weed to make this hash smell right i think he was talking more along the lines of like apple wood or like you know like yeah, but weed's the only yeah, thing i want my weed to taste I, like you, can do a mesquite yeah, you gotta do or... weed you want mesquite weed and barbecue weed <laughs> Dude, people, what kind of southern boy are dude, you? God I damn. love smoke shit. Bro. Bro. I know people weed. Will be down for some smoked fucking hash. <laughs> this weed dangle tastes like chitlins and barbecue. People sweet love tea. smoked you everything. Smoke Judgey's craft cannabis. There's a lot of shit on your pork, kid. <laughs> oh my god, I'm dying. Oh, uh, dude, tree holies. Chat's cracking up right now. Joe G's was like, hey, man, drizzle some of that on your pork there, kid. <laughs> hey. and, uh, always have a greenhouse of some sort um, for a backup plan, you know, something that's covered so you can have some sort of insurance. You know, that's the only thing I can take away. Yeah, D DJ Gullah just got like quote of the night, man. Smokey and the Bandit <laughs> cultivar coming out this winter. <laughs> Burt, Burt Reynolds F2. <laughs> oh, yeah. hazard boys, dangerous. Oh, man. That's funny. Smoked bacon terps. Yeah, you think you want it, but then you smoke it, you're like, yeah. Well, you say I have an ounce of this? Stabby has, you know, uh, Stabby has that one that tastes like pepperoni. So I'm sure you throw a little smoked hash in there with that. It might actually be kind of good. I'm going to stick with my garlic turps. Oh, you like garlic turps with no smoke shit. Okay. <laughs> Were you just waiting for that? Were you just waiting for me to say it? It felt like you just had that written down. It's like you wrote it and you're like, he said it, go. <laughs> he said it, spit it out. Oh, so we got a Burt Reynolds in the chat here, Rad Daddy. Somebody breed a strain that smells like fresh Nikes, that fresh Jordan smell. Brass Jordan, that's a good name. There you go. So, Proce <laughs> processed leather. Don't we don't we confuse fresh Jordan smell with sweatshop smell? Mm, child labor. Well, whatever. <laughs> Still makes me smile. Yeah. Anybody grow fruit trees? Anybody got any trees at home? Anybody growing anything? Like other than Dan, he's got he's I got he's a veggie I got a veggie garden, but 
no avocado fruit trees. I'm growing a pile of dishes that might impress you. <laughs> I grow, I grow a few of those, man. I got three little boys, man. Myself, I'm not, it's, you know, it's just me here, bro. Dishes. It's just me. No one's gonna be like, you need to do those dishes, but me. So <laughs> when yeah. I get about this high, maybe They'll stack up. Yeah, yeah. There's still another fork. We're good. I'm no, I'm no, I'm no stranger to drinking out of a bowl or cutting the top off of a fucking water bottle and pouring some shit in there. <laughs> no stranger to that, bro. Hey, man, you got to do what you got to do. Suburban listen, camping. It, listen, it, it's a lot quicker just to cut the top off that water bottle than it is to go do the dishes and clean I, all the gl- oh, clean all the glasses. Wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna tell the man that you had to get your knife out and cut that bottle. I always, you no, I always have shears on my hip. That's the thing. I always have garden shears on my hip, so it's nothing sterile. It's cutting that water bottle, brother. I'll tell you that. Big shout out to Earthbound Organics. I'm not sure why, but they love me. I love you too. Hugs and kisses. <laughs> well, it's getting to be that time, boys. So, what do you say? We gonna want to wrap it up for this week hell yeah looks like i'm getting a nod from everybody so yeah i think we're gonna uh, think we're gonna wrap final it up this shout week. Out. Fuck, because i always forget to do this this coming saturday uh chronic table my little group is doing uh beers and buds with buds uh saturday 8 p.m pacific time so that come on ahead cool let's get some more final shout outs and jeff uh, where, where can we find you? I can I can talk a lot about shout outs. Catch my auction on Cannibals at 10 o'clock. There's another auction ending on Cannibals. Also follow my podcast, the Grow From Your Heart podcast. Uh, it's right here on YouTube. It's on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, anywhere where you can find a respectable podcast. They let me put mine there. Uh, check it out, the Grow From Your Heart podcast. That's enough for me. Thanks for having me, Dan. It was a good time. All right. Mr. Tanasi Gardens, where can we find you? Hey, check me out on uh, Instagram, Tanasi Gardens and Sacred Three Mushrooms, three spelled out. And then uh, I have a website. You can check me out there too. Sacred All Three right. Mushrooms. The dishes are done, man. The dishes are done. All right, Mr. Bacillus, how about you? Where can we find you? You guys can catch me at Mr. Bacillus on Instagram. All right. Zen Premium Cannabis. That's Instagram and YouTube. Zen Premium Cannabis. Type it in, you'll find me. See you there. All right. And Tyler, what about you? Where can we find you? Hey, uh, Instagram at Family Tree Seeds. Um, trying to build the the cannabis um, profile. Trying to get over there. I want to leave the IG beast. Um, so go over there. I'm going to auction off some stuff. I'm going to put out the last two available packs of the pandemic. Um, it's the last of the first pandemic cross cross. pandemic is fucking stellar. It's a line. I decided this season that I'm going to work much further. Uh, I've already made the second pollination for the F twos with the selections uh, of it. It is a triangle Kush uh, cross to chem 91, the real cuts. Uh, verified basically CSI Humboldt, Caleb over there. He's always, he's one of those solids that always you can count on. He has the real stuff. He has the real stuff. Uh, he reversed the Chem 91, uh, put it onto the Triangle Kush and uh, released a, a fem line called Gator Bait. And I went through some Gator Bait and I pulled out this stellar female that to the last drop, if you're a joint smoker, it is lip smackingly delicious never seen a strain in my life last speaking his so language late. right there um it is a phenomenal plant that had excellent grease resin chem chem type character it was it was a great plant there were a lot of uh a lot of plants i didn't like in there there was you know some things that i had to you know but i found a, a winner uh that got tagged with my selected pam f2 stud so that was a uh, a killer thing that i call pandemic in the test runs and all those things. I started, there's a couple pictures up on the Instagram. Um, we're gonna put a, put a couple more out of the selections uh, here over the next couple of days. But out of that first group, since I have my selections, the remaining packs of seeds, I'm gonna put up for auction up on Cannabis to try to get people to go over there because I don't have anybody over there looking for me yet. I wanna I wanna be a big man over there like Ross to Jeff and you know get people you know looking at my page. So. I'm going to get, get rid of some nice stuff to hopefully, hey, you find me on Cannabuzz, I'm going to set some stuff up. I'm going to put up some pictures. We're going to do that. Say, that sounds uh, great, man. Like uh, gonna, Dan's been craving triangle kush for the longest time. He would do, that's right up his alley. That's some fire. 
<clears throat> fucking pandemic, bacon grease man. splashing so hard it won't fit in the picture. Uh-huh. That's looking good, bro. Oh, bro, bacon grease. Don't let me scare you with that, bro. Try to stand That's back sad, further or something. I'll give you a cut of that if you want a cut of that bad boy. You want one of those? Bro, I'm, that, I'm nearly <laughs> vegan, but I'll fuck with your bacon grease. Hell yeah, <laughs> dude. I, that's the Pam some... fifteen. That's Pam fifteen crossed to a dosi do uh, eighteen, which is the Kush dominant dosi do um, F two. It was a resin male that I found in there. Uh, so I went through a bunch of F twos of the dosi do eighteen, pulled out a resin male with fucking visible, awesome resin, nasty. OG Kush stature, really tall and lanky and, you know, upright branch and just a bitchin' plant, the signature leaf shape, like a bitchin' plant. Uh, you can see pictures of it on my Instagram a little ways back, but it's a bitchin' plant. Uh, I hit that to my Pan 15. My Pan 15 is a fucking monster stretch machine and out came bacon grease. And I'm telling you, bacon grease, you're, you called that, man. That's You saw it first. You, yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's coming. Some donkey dicks on there, bro. Yeah, I'll give you a oh, yeah. more though. Yeah. All right. So Great. we'll talk about this more next week. So that's going to do it for us, guys. And once again, peace out, one love, and we will catch y'all on the next one.